So, so, so the imagery in that is 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 sort of a walk through um, to an extent the, the the parts of the world that that I was in um, in the putting together of, of this book, um, and that those parts of the world were also historical as well as geographical. Um, the last book I wrote, All the President's Bankers, was very much um, historical. It went through the last uh, century and a bit of the relationship of presidents in both parties and the bankers and just sort of what the actual personal relationships were and how they were uh, interacting before various types of world events, wars, policies, and so forth. And this was kind of that, but from just the 10 years since the financial crisis of 2008, um, and in rather going back to the history of one country, I sort of expanded it to um, what's happened globally since the financial crisis. Um, and to get to the punchline first, because I also want you to feel like you can interrupt me and ask questions. I know I'm here to speak to you, um, but you're, you know, sort of a, a very informed group. And so I think that if I say something that's either troubling or confusing or you want me to expand or whatever it might be, just, you know, shout out because I think that that will be 
a good thing. Um, but anyway, so I, I divide my book into the regions of, of the world that were either involved or affected or impacted by the financial crisis and the sort of how they've acted differently since then. And I talk about collusion. It's not about Russia. It's not about politics. Um, well, everything is ultimately about money and politics, but that's not the point of the book. The point of the book is to look at what the main central banks in the world have done in a sort of unprecedented way since the financial crisis to artificially kind of stimulate the financial system, the banks, and subsequently the markets um, in a way that's been very um, historically epic in terms of size, but also in terms of just their um, unlimited capabilities um, in terms of the amounts that they've created, in terms of not being able to, you know, no auditing, no, no sort of information going in and out as to where that money actually goes. Um, and so what I did was I, I didn't have a chapter on the Federal Reserve, which I'll talk about in a bit more in a second, which is kind of the central character. Um, if we look at central banks as just sort of characters throughout the world and the individuals that run them as just the characters that are part of those scenes. Um, I, I took 2008 as the beginning of each chapter in each region, and I always started there and then looked at how that region was impacted. So I go to Mexico, um, to Brazil, to China, to Japan, and throughout Europe. And each time I sort of go back to the beginning and say, okay, well, this is the perspective of what happened between the Federal Reserve of the United States in this area, um, and this is how the fallout um, occurred, or this is how they expanded, but not really. Um, and, and my general theme is that having had an unprecedented amount of money being thrown into the system, sort of fabricated or manufactured or conjured by the central banks, has really distorted um, the idea of value. It's, it's even distorted the idea of where, how companies who actually um, you know, sort of show their profits and losses based on actual cash, um, actual revenues, and so forth that aren't artificially stimulated by money coming in from an outside source are, are sort of in operating in a world in which they're also ones that are. And so in terms of just the graph of that, I wasn't, again, going to do slides because I tend to, um, I can just write on this. Um, so, so, the, so the way that looks, and if anyone wants me to just mention what a central bank is while I'm making sure of these right, um, does everybody know what a central bank is? OK, so, so, so basically, the central bank, and the Fed in particular here, um, was designed, um, usually designed to provide emergency capital in the event that the financial system can't produce it for itself. It's going to create a bigger crisis for the rest of the economy. There needs to be um, a particular reaction to, say, a war or like you know interplanetary aliens coming or something like that. And that the, the, the reality is, that they have clauses in their mandates that are emergency clauses to be able to do this. So it's all quite legal. Um, and I'm not advocating um, that the collusion of central banks is something that's illegal. I do get asked that question. But it is something that's, to an extent, deceitful. Um, because by having a large supply of artificial money that has no limitation in terms of when and how it can be fabricated, as it has been the last 10 years, it, that distortion thing um, does create a level of deceit. So one of the things that happened since the financial crisis, I'm bad at drawing, but I'm just going to, this is 2008, and this is now. And um, I have this on my Twitter, uh, this, this particular graph, but I thought it was cool because it was three lines. Um, one was the Federal Reserve and how much money and when it dumped it into the system. Um, one is the Cent uh, Bank of Japan, and one is the European Central Bank. Because the idea of this collusion is that the major country central banks um, have also adopted a cheap money policy and a quantitative easing or buying securities policy, buying bonds, buying uh, ETFs or buying stocks if you're in Japan, buying corporate bonds if you're in Europe, where they've been able to fabricate money and, and decide where effectively they want to invest it, but they go through a financial system and that has an impact on the market. So the Fed kind of started this in 2008 and, and, and sort of they did some sort of a taper in terms of this, this line represents the amount of money they conjured since the 2008 period to buy, um, in the case of the United States, treasury bonds, government bonds, um, and mortgage bonds from, from the banking system. Um, and so this is kind of 2015. And though they haven't, this isn't really, yeah, it's a tiny line down. Um, though they haven't continued here, um, they did, they have a pretty high value, four and a half trillion dollars of what I consider to be subsidies for the banking system in the market because they're really coming out of the sort of the electronic um, uh, activities of the Fed. So this is the Fed line. Colors don't mean anything, by the way. I'm just randomly 
picking colors. Um, then the European Central Bank um, kind of came in and did something similar, um, except that they were kind of here. And then they, they kind of did that. Right, so this is the European Central Bank. Um, this is kind of 2012, where uh, my, my bad geometrics is such that they kind of accelerated their process of being involved in quantitative easing um, by a lot when there was a credit crisis in Europe. So the minute there wasn't enough money in Europe, they thought they had recovered, they really hadn't. They were still adopting the policy, including with the Fed, to produce money in the system, they, uh, they kind of accelerated. And in this period of time where the, the Fed sort of stopped putting as much in, they've accelerated even further. So now they're around um, that five and a half trillion. And then the Bank of Japan, which was the bank that actually created quantitative easing to begin with, they came up in 2001 of this idea that if they produced money into the system, because their banks were basically uh, undergoing a collapse in the beginning of the 2000s, that they would um, have a way to, to help them. And they, they did produce money. They did engage in quantitative easing, but it was really, really tiny. So I talk about in my Japan chapter how Ben Bernanke, who was the chair of the Fed when all this kind of started, um, goes in front of Congress and talks about how what we're doing is not what the Japanese are doing. It's really different. Um, we're doing it for other purposes. But the reality is that the mechanism is the same. They're producing um, money in order to increase the money supply, in order to then decide where it goes into the banking system, into corporations who then borrow it, which then goes into the stock market or other, other financial assets. So, so the Bank of Japan was kind of also um, here. And then in about 2013, they did that. It's not really right. They did that. So they're around at like five trillion right now. Um, and basically, the reason they sort of had an acceleration in about 2013, 2014, is because, from an economic perspective, having watched all of this happen, um, the prime minister of the, the, the head of Japan, Shinzo Abe, decided that we should be doing the same thing or being doing more so of that in Japan. And so the head of the central bank now in Japan, um, Kuroda, this is uh, Mario Draghi, and currently this now at the Fed, you know, through different periods, is Jerome Powell, but there's been three different uh, Fed heads, two different Japanese heads, and, and two different European heads over this time period, um, they've all kind of engaged in the same process. And as a result, there's about, um, well, this is 15 trillion. But when you, when you aggregate all of these numbers and you aggregate all of this graph, the level of money that's continuing to be conjured and dumped into the system is going up. So when you hear in the news that the Fed is tapering, that they're, that they're doing this and this somehow is a reflection of their experiments in quantitative easing and cheap money succeeding, you have to understand, and this is the, the collusive um, efforts involved, that, that collectively the world is, is increasing their amount of quantitative easing. It's just happening in different countries for different reasons. And in the European Central Bank realm, it's being dumped into corporates for the most part. In Japan, it's a combination of government bonds and stocks. And in the US, it's, it's kind of stopped. It was a combination of government bonds and mortgage bonds. So it was always going into the place that needed the most help. But, but the, say, corporations in, the, in, in Europe that needed that help um, were receiving it basically without giving very much in return. The European Central Bank would decide, well, we're going to give money to this particular company in Germany versus these particular companies in Greece. And that was, a, that was in, in a lot of ways, a political decision. But the monetary elements of that um, enabled certain countries and certain companies and certain stocks to go higher simply because there was an outside artificial source um, to, to push things higher. And so when I started going around the world and sort of examining what, what the real actors were doing throughout this period, this is just kind of the summary. And you know, the summary, again, looks like this. Uh, Right from like a half a trillion. Um, 
you know, you, you, there, there's a picture that starts to be developed, and that's that the, the ones that had the ability to produce money did. Their markets have risen more substantially. There has been more sort of speculation outside of those markets, because once they go up, where else do you go? Capital flows out. It goes to Mexico, it goes, goes to Brazil, and so forth. But in those kinds of countries, there's less of an ability, and they didn't choose necessarily to get involved in quantitative easing. So there was an entire sort of political ramification that doesn't really get discussed behind just the value of money and the amount of quantitative easing that these major central banks are doing that actually has changed kind of the shape of the world. Um, so the first country I go to in collusion is actually Mexico. Um, and, and the reason I did that is that I spent a lot of time um, working with companies in Mexico and stuff. Um, but that basically, the Mexican government and the individuals who were really involved in the period from the 2008 to 2018 that were running the central bank in Mexico had real strong opinions about what the Fed was doing. And a lot of countries had strong opinions about what the Fed was doing because to an extent it's just not fair. It's, it's not really capitalism. It's not really free markets. It's kind of like you know, a subsidy for the financial system that then has major ramifications of creating an artificial system. And that can go terribly wrong very quickly um, if it gets taken away, which is why it's not being taken away. And there's ramifications to that. So what Mexico decided in 2008, and their, their economy is actually doing fine. Um, the crisis happens north of the border. In the beginning, they say, well, it doesn't really affect us. It's a financial crisis. It's contained in the banks. Fed's taking care of it. But then it starts to become apparent very, very quickly that that's not the case, that if there's a recession in the states or if there's a depression in the states or if the financing closes up and there's no credit uh, going throughout the system, it impacts everyone. So the head of the Central Bank of Mexico, a guy named Guillermo Ortiz, he went to Washington. He was part of the establishment. He sort of, you know, floated in the sort of economic ideas of the Fed uh, governors and so forth. He goes up to Washington. He says to Ben Bernanke, look, we've, we've seen this movie. We know how it ends. It doesn't end well. We had the tequila crisis in 94. We restructured our banking system. Smaller banks got eaten up. People got thrown out of jobs. Companies closed. It took us a really long time to recover. And, and more than just the economic problems of recovery, our people lost confidence in the system. And there, that, that manifested in, in lots of crowds in the streets. But the point was, um, if you simply create money to simply help the financial system, to help the banks, it's, it's not really stable capital. It's not really ultimately going to work. Um, there will be bubbles. There will be problems. And Ben Bernanke says, thanks, doesn't cover Ortiz in his memoirs at all. Um, even though this meeting was covered by the Wall Street Journal, it was public. Um, and he basically goes about in sort of manufacturing this, this uh, emergency quantitative easing mount and then has the whole world join in. Why does the whole world join in? Or why do the major countries join in to any quantitative easing movement? Um, because if you have capital in the US and money is made very cheap, so it's, it's more liquid to the financial system so they can sort of sort out the stuff they did. Um, and rates are higher elsewhere, in particular in the main countries in which there's, with which there's trade or with which the banks have relationships, then the money's going to leave. And so the only way to sort of keep the dollar strong enough and keep the money in the US is to have the export the same uh, method to the countries that have the, the largest relationships. So something like Mexico has to also deal with its own economy. So if it reduces rates by too much, that will cause inflation in the economy because it's, it, it has a more direct impact on actual people and on actual prices because it's a smaller economy to begin with um, and it's reliant on other economies for its trade by, by more so. So Ortiz didn't want to reduce rates like the Fed was doing very quickly and they couldn't produce money electronically to buy securities in Mexico. They didn't have the same capacity. Um, and so they didn't. So he didn't. He went about criticizing the US. As a result, he sort of lost his job, or he didn't get reappointed um, to be the head of the Central Bank of Mexico. And his subsequent appointee, um, a man named Augustin Karstens, who um, also sort of was in the same group um, as the people running the Fed, Treasury Department, and so forth, came in. And he, f at first, said, OK, I'll do what the Fed's going to do. I'll reduce rates. I'll keep it sort of stable between the border of Mexico and the US. I'll, I'll follow along. He used to go public about the fact that this easing was going to help the real economy, ultimately will trickle out of the banking system and out of the markets, and it'll help sort of real growth and long-term growth and wages and everything else. Um, and that's what he said originally. That's kind of how he, he got that job and had that job for a while in this period. But, but the reality was, um, it didn't do that. And he started 
feeling the political pressure in Mexico, the fact that Mexico wasn't really getting any of this money into their economy, and it was very, very obvious. Um, and so he started criticizing the Fed and everything else, and he ultimately resigned um, before the end of his term last year. And he's now the head of the Bank of International Settlements, which is the central bank of central banks that does reporting on all of these activities and always used to support the Fed, um, the IMF, the World Bank, the, the ECB when it came into being as doing the right thing by their economies, by employment versus inflation, which is one of their mandates, by helping their system. And it was created basically as a sort of unified US, Europe kind of entity to begin with. It's starting to have real critiques. And the fact that it is now run by someone who bought then kind of sold the policy of the United States and is now at the head of that institution really shows a shift in general in the world in terms of how it looks at what the end game of this could be, how risky it could be for the rest of the world, um, and is just simply questioning how long this can go on. Um, so that's been one shift. Another shift, it's a longer story, I won't get into it, um, is in Brazil, um, because that has its, its so many of its own uh, sort of pieces of corruption and scandals and government overthrows and so forth. But one of the people who's currently running for the presidency of Brazil um, is a man named Enrique Morales. I pronounced it Marais because for some reason my Portuguese is very bad. I was, I was corrected last night actually in Berkeley about my pronunciation of his name. But he was someone who was head of the Central Bank of Brazil when this all started, when, when the crisis all started happening. Um, and he and the president of Brazil at the time, uh, Lula, who's now in jail, was um, at first saying Brazil's not going to be impacted by the crisis, same way Mexico said it wasn't going to be until they were very shortly thereafter. Um, and he wanted to do what the US want, was doing. Um, the party in power, who became in power, um, the Workers' Party, uh, headed by a woman named Dilma Rousseff, said, no, we want to maintain help for Brazil. Um, he says we want to do what the US, so he, lose, he, doesn't get re he doesn't get appointed to be the central bank leader. He goes back into the private sector. He winds up being the Minister of Finance um, when her government was overthrown. And so he's basically gone from being a central banker uh, to private sector to being uh, a minister of finance, and now he's running for president. In the meantime, Brazil, uh, during that period, and this is just where politics meets monetary policy, um, has basically reduced its rates from, this is a completely separate graph, this doesn't count on that graph, they've <laughs> reduced their rates from 14.5% to 6.5%. Um, in a very short period of time. Mexico has raised its rates from 3.5% um, to 7.5% um, in the last few years as well. So they've gone independent of the Fed. They've gone sort of dependent on the Fed. Um, and, and, and that really manifests into political relationships. If you're an investor, it actually also manifests into figuring out why this has happened, because it's very unique that actually Mexico has higher uh, rates than, than Brazil. Um, so, so, so there's a lot of shakeout as well from a monetary policy perspective where government bonds are trading, where stocks are trading, and, and who's shifting in the sort of power relationships of, of central banks and also uh, the governments. Now central banks are supposed to be independent of governments. That's how they um, are mandated. So supposedly the Federal Reserve is independent of um, whatever the, the US government wants to do. The Bank of Japan is, is independent. Um, and there's a lot of, um, I, I went through a lot of documentation. I had this team of researchers around the world who knew languages that I didn't know. And so we were, we were looking at real sort of um, media publications at the time, real documents and research information that was coming from these central banks themselves. Um, and, 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 and it was interesting because there was a lot of, um, both criticism of what was happening on the outside and trying to figure out if they should adopt it on the inside, um, which is part of where um, where there's a lot of tension and still tension in the world. Um, but China, which is the middle of the book, um, is a place that has grown in its superpowerness from an economic perspective and also its relationships with other countries. And one of the reasons it doesn't get talked about um, is that it chose to criticize very vocally um, the monetary policy of the United States um, because of this, this whole creation of money 
policy. Now, it has created money as well, but it chooses to do it outside of sort of the main G7 groups. Um, and it does it for different purposes. And you probably know this here. I mean, it does it for building infrastructure, for, for paying for technology and R&D um, and individuals, and also for trade alliances with other countries in that region, with Mexico, with Brazil, in order to establish itself as, as a sort of more, um, both from a trade perspective and a monetary perspective, um, superpower. The reason that all started to happen in 2008, 2009 is because the head of central, the central bank in China, the, at the People's Bank of China, um, got very public with his criticism of the Fed. Ultimately, the Chinese currency, the ren, was accepted into the IMF's um, special drawing rights basket, which is the sort of representation of the main currencies that had always been the dollar and the euro, um, which had before that been the German mark and the French franc um, and the Japanese yen and the British pound. And in, the, in, in this period of time, the Chinese currency, the ren, became part of this basket because even the IMF that had been established to really work on the reserve currencies of the dollar and the euro mainly, um, was beginning to criticize whether all this money being dumped in the system when it is retracted or when rates rise or when something goes wrong with all the debt that's been created on the back of it um, causes problems throughout the developing world, causes problems w within the US. So they've been very uh, critical of late as well. Um, but China's been able to utilize that um, in order to really become and create more trade agreements and more currency arrangements, um, and also develop their, their alliances and their own companies within China. That's what they've been doing with that money. We really haven't been. We've been um, just, just as a sort of superpower. Um, this money has predominantly gone into financial speculation, into the markets. It hasn't been dedicated to um, you know, sort of building a railway or, or building a canal or, or, or anything like that, or, or lending to other countries in order for them to be able to do that because they're partners and that strengthens them, and therefore the, the trade relationship. We, we've really gone sort of off the rails relative to that. That's not to say China doesn't have problems. It's just to say that um, in this period of time, money's been created here um, and in Europe and in Japan for, and, and to a lesser extent um, in the UK for a different reason. And, and, and that reason has been more of a financial reason and not so much as a long-term economic stability uh, reason as it has in Asia. I talked a little bit about Europe, and um, I was sort of the last chapter of the book. But one of the, man, one of the things that's come out of the ECB's policy, um, aside from the fact that there is criticism from certain countries like Germany against the ECB because they're like, our country is fine. We have savers. We're developing. We don't need this whole easing thing, we don't want to be concerned about bubbles bursting, um, is that the sort of southern part of Europe, Greece, Italy, Spain, and so forth, haven't had the benefit um, of the same amount of money being put in. So when there's a lot of money that's put in in one part of the market, um, and it's not sort of divided or, or even selected or chosen to be put in other parts of the market, it creates inequalities and volatility and instability. So what we've seen in the last few months in, in even our stock market is, is a sort of beginning of more volatility coming into the market, more sort of defaults and delinquencies coming into some of the corporate bonds that were um, issued because money was so cheap and therefore repaying the debt was so low, um, but the debt payments will get higher. Um, and also money coming out of the stock market to make debt payments. And then separately buybacks, which, which keep the level of the market up. So you have these two sort of competing forces of capital um, that are creating more volatility now. You have cheap money still available. Um, you have a lot of buybacks, some, some from companies that have cash and some from companies that have received cash. Um, but nonetheless, and then you also have cracks in the system from both the rumors um, that are in the market as to whether or not this can stop. Um, anytime any of these central bank leaders talk about the possibility of it stopping, the markets tend to get really, really upset. And then the next meeting, there's like, oh, we didn't really mean it. There isn't really inflation. There isn't really growth. We're going to stop, um, which is what he does a lot. I mean, they all do it. but. Um, it, it's interesting because even, even the Japanese um, last week had a meeting, the Bank of Japan, and they came out and they said, well, we're going to probably have to keep doing this like forever. Um, they use the term unlimited. Um, Mario Draghi said the same thing um, a week and a half ago when the European Central Bank came out and said, yes, we're keeping rates at negative, um, and we're also going to continue our quantitative easing program. So these lines up. The Fed is kind of, yes. I have a question though. I mean, is there really an alternative to printing all this money? Because if you look at the rate of debt creation over the past 30, almost 40 years, you know, debt growth has exceeded GDP growth 
almost that entire time, there are projections that so many public pensions will be insolvent, that there's no like mathematical way to make that possible. So is is unlimited money printing just the easiest way to kind of like softly default on that rather than causing some catastrophic collapse? Well, it, or, or pushing into, or having to worry about a solution to it. I mean, yes, that has increased over the last 30, 40 years relative to GDP, but it's in, it's accelerated by a lot. It's increased because it's, it's had this sort of plaster over. So if the financial system, which kind of started this, this, um, in, in 2008 was on the brink of, of what it said to be collapse. There were different ways that that could have been addressed. One way would have been to let one or two extra banks collapse. And that really sounded harsh at the time. Um, but you know, throughout Wall Street, banks have collapsed. I mean, it's, it's not like that. That hadn't happened. And the problem was there was so much attention focused on whether that was going to create a massive depression going forward that there was no conversation or very limited conversation in Washington as to doing something else. Um, you're, I'm sure, very mathy. The, the reality, I'll just go back for like one little explanation of, of how I saw that, um, was at the time of the 2008 financial crisis, um, there was, there was, um, which was predicated on, on mortgage bonds and all the derivatives associated with them and all the credit that, and insurance that was traded between banks and all of that. Um, there was only like a half a trillion dollars worth of upset subprime mortgages in the market at the time, a half a trillion, right? Um, there was $14 trillion worth of toxic assets, of assets that were reliant on those subprime mortgages paying their interest and if they didn't get paid, would start to deteriorate in value. Banks lent to investors around the world, including pension funds, inclu or helped pension funds, including you know, municipalities, corporations, other financial entities, uh, 10 times that. So $140 trillion effectively was on offer going after a half a trillion dollars of subprime related assets. So that problem is what caused an acceleration of the production of artificial capital um, in order to solve what was really a, a major financial crisis. It, it was. But what could have been done is you could have just paid off a half a trillion dollars worth of subprime mortgages. And, and forget whether that's an ideology of you're paying people who didn't deserve it or banks. It doesn't matter. The, the economics of it would have been far, far cheaper. Instead, the decision was made to plaster over that and to start this creation of 0% money so that banks would have the liquidity to start to, re whoever was still left standing, to repay each other so that companies could repay uh, some of the money they had borrowed that were still left standing um, that were involved in this. And as a result, um, it has created a, an extra level of capital in the system that makes um, debt accelerate, and it also makes stock levels go up artificially um, so that the next time there's a crisis, you're falling from a much higher height. So absolutely, they want that not to happen, which is why every single time a Fed chair says, there's growth, there's inflation, this is like, you can trade this. I mean, if you're just even looking at this from an investment perspective, um, it's going to be followed by some major hiccup in the market, and then some other central bank, or maybe the same one, or someone in their country saying, well, no, we didn't mean it. And, and that's exactly what the European Central Bank was talking about growth a minute ago. So was the, the Bank of England. They were going to be raising rates. All these rumors in the market, it, it put the pound up, and you know, Brexit's fine. It's all, it's all going to be worked out. The central bank's going to raise rates. It's a sign of strength. It's going to help our currency into negotiations with Europe. There's all these sort of discussions and, and, and media narratives and, and politics going on back and forth. Reality is they don't have the growth. And the central bank head last week said, by the way, uh, things aren't so great. Um, they did not. Well, they can raise rates on Thursday. They're not going to, I think, um, because actually the numbers don't bear them out. And also it, it, it hurt the market. And so, yes, you are right. Long answer to, to your question. But the reality is they, they want to keep this going. They found a method to do it. And that just means that when things crack, they crack from a much higher height than they would have or even did um, during 2008. So now we have $4.5 trillion in the market as money supply. And it was extra. Only, extra, exactly. It was right. only how come inflation hasn't happened? Because all this money are in the that banks. That is such a good question. And, and Different people ask that in different settings for, I think, different reasons. And it, I think that inflation has not risen on the sort of average generic way that inflation is considered and calculated. 
because this money has inflated markets. It, 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 th this is inflation. The, the level, uh, well, a third graph, would, well, this and, and sort of the stock market. Um, so it's kind of dipped a little bit, but it's sort of like that. And you have QE1, you know, QE2, QE3, you know, Europe, Japan, and so forth. Um, that, that ultimately this 15 trillion and, and 21 trillion if you add in all the other banks that are involved and the market level is pretty much the same. So there has been a tremendous amount of inflation. There's been inflation in the money supply, but it has gone into inflation of financial assets. It's gone into lining new debt. It's gone into inflating the value of stock because it's been an artificial source of money that's been used not just for stock buybacks, because that's kind of a one-to-one -one relationship, but, but all along the way, it's been there as a sort of security blanket um, for banks to be able to leverage more companies or leveraging more. Right now, actually, they're on average, um, companies in, in the S&P are leveraged more than they were before the financial crisis. So there's inflation, but it's not inflation of real prices. Where it had been for a while, for example, in Mexico, where they were reducing rates, it was inflating real prices because the relationship of that central bank and that monetary policy was more closely connected to the real economy. And the fact that we don't have inflation in, in these countries, because we don't um, officially, but we have inflation in financial assets is, is a sign of how just sort of off the rails this, this, this has gone. And my second question quickly. Um, but also, we used to have the gold standard, which would basically be something we could peg, right? the actual value of a dollar to. Today we don't have that, but we also have petrodollars, which are representing kind of an asset or resource that can be traded. Is that also why the dollar is still strong and we haven't lost the value of the dollar in the market, or is that completely unrelated to? It's, it's not entirely unrelated. The, the concept of the gold standard um, was something or has been something, not returning to it exactly as it was pre-71, but, but, but returning to some sort of component of gold, say in the special drawing rights basket. So you have your five currencies and, and you have gold and they're sort of an average. So you have something that's a real asset or, or some sort of manner bringing back a version of the gold standard gets discussed. But for example, when the Chinese, uh, Chinese central bank was, was criticizing this Fed policy of just sort of inflating a sort of currency, but, but not having anything real behind it to back it, um, ben Bernanke actually went on the defensive, and um, I have this in, in, in different parts of the book throughout the years, and, and started talking about how we, we don't want a gold standard. Like, it wasn't even brought up as a topic when he started defending it. And one of the reasons, or just throwing it away as, as, as a potential, and one of the reasons for that is you can't create gold. Um, this is not to say that, that we should be on a full gold standard or that it's, it's, it's actually a practical development, but having gold as a portion of, of a currency basket makes some sense because it's it's just an anchor. Um, it's it's just something that's that's actually physically there, and it's physically um, it doesn't retain the same kind of value the more there's other currencies and there's more speculation in the market that it might have if everything was going off of real trade and real hard assets. Um, but it, but it had that it, ha it had an anchor level to it. And, and the fact that it isn't a part of the main system, but it is something that gets bought up by some of the countries, the emerging countries that are trying to trade with each other, their own currencies, um, as well as to try to have more of a portion of gold reserves in the potential um, that they create some sort of standard amongst themselves or something outside of the dollar, outside of the euro, um, is certainly something that has kind of been reinitiated in, in this whole process. Like where that goes and how long it, it takes to get there, um, I, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's people out there so the dollar's gonna deflate tomorrow and gold's gonna like go sky high. I mean, I think there's a trend to gold being considered as something that should anchor um, this but and, and other countries using their currencies and trading with each other, like China and Russia, like Europe and Japan. There's a lot of trade agreements that have been developed in, and I, I have a lot of them in, in, in collusion, but that have been developed in these years amongst countries um, to try and offset some of the potential risk of really this policy. Not, not simply the dollar geopolitically, but really the policy of, of sort of bolstering a system that's not really restructured and that has the, the potential to, to bring down uh, an economy or multiple economies again. Um, one alternative that, that comes up in questions is, is, is cryptocurrencies. Um, 
and for, for similar reasons. And, and what's interesting is that though there's a lot of volatility in Bitcoin and other currencies, um, and, and, and there's a lot of risk in, in being involved in them. There's, they're speculating in them, which has its own risk attached. But there's actually, if you're going to use them on a regular basis, um, that kind of volatility could, you know, ruin anyone's business on any given day or pop it up. And that's not the kind of volatility in the real economy that most people can, um, can or should handle. Um, but the idea of having alternatives, any alternatives to the system, um, is very much an accelerated concept because of, of, of how it's been handled. Because nothing has really been reformed or fixed. It's just been plastered over by, by sort of this artificial uh, part of the, the system. So the head of the IMF, Christine Lagarde, who, again, IMF, the International Monetary Fund, very much a part of the system, very much involved in the whole dollar European currency system from when it was created in the wake of World War II. And it was created to basically subsidize countries that were allies of the US and Europe. I mean, this is kind of part of the point. Um, she currently has been on multiple public arenas talking about alternative currencies and how cryptocurrency is, is something that is happening and it's, it's expanding and they need to be aware of it. Um, there are full SWAT teams at the Federal Reserve now that, that are doing that sort of under um, the radar. And there's also, you know, you can get jobs at the European Central Bank right now that are listed to be involved in developing, um, you know, technology related to, to, to cryptocurrency analysis and so forth right now. So um, they're, they're definitely all involved from a different perspective. But the idea of it, it sort of, um, yeah, of who actually ultimately gets the sort of regulation of it versus the use of it, um, I think is still up for grabs because if, you had cryptos created by the same central banks that are creating this currency, um, then you don't necessarily gain sort of autonomy from this system by doing that. But if, but if there are cryptos that are regulated by a portion of this so that they're not as sort of volatile for end users, then they actually might have, um, might spread that much more quickly. I'll ask a follow-up question to that. I've kind of, uh just as a dabbler in cryptocurrency, you know, people always ask, well, what is it based on? And the answer is, well, not, not much, but it does have a fixed supply. I think of just the original Bitcoin, like 21 million coins. Well, gold is a fixed supply. So when I look at those, I think um, I've, you know, so one of the arguments is, uh, well, sure, you know, Bitcoin is volatile, but if nobody's on the gold standard, it doesn't matter either. It's kind of an odd, magical thing to me of how people decide to buy into um, agreeing to uh, stick with a fixed supply of anything when it comes to, I guess I would say, a game this big, what would be the, the motive? Would it just be uh, looking for something stable? And, and what, would, what would, bring, would bring this air balloon back down, I guess? You know, I, I think the idea, um, and it's slightly different, I mean, the, the, the language for crypto is similar to the language for, for gold, and that's, that's not an accident. And the idea of having a fixed supply as, as part of what sort of pegs it to some form of anchor, right, is, is not an accident either. With respect to gold, it doesn't mean that you can't have speculation in gold, and it does, if you had a gold standard or a similar thing to a gold standard, you could still have speculation, you could still um, have uh, stockpiles of gold, you can still sort of squeeze the market, etc. But But the idea of anything outside of the system is that it, it, it is fixed and it, it does have a limitation and this process has been particularly unlimited. I mean, it, 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 it's still going up. Um, and so even though the Fed can say talk about tapering or stopping to buy at this particular moment or creating money or creating dollars to basically continue this process, the reality is if things go south, there's, there's no limitation on Let's just create another few trillion. There was no limitation on, on literally any of the process. And so talking about assets, hard assets or crypto um, currencies as a way to um, you know, just, just infuse a limitation to the system should in theory be able to reduce the volatility of the system. Now on any given day, there's you know, the market's moving for different reasons, you know, geopolitics, wars, trade, trade wars, whatever. But, but in terms of the overall backdrop of the system, if you have something that's real, that's, that's there as a peg or even a proportional, a proportion of all the currency activity in the world, the idea is that it should reduce the risk. It's like any portfolio, it's like portfolio finance. It's like if you have more, the idea is if you're diversified, you, you reduce the risk. Now in practice, you have to watch what's going on. 
Um, but if you have a standard of some sort outside of the system that's limited, that should reduce the volatility ultimately of the system and it should act as a sort of counterbalance to the unlimitedness um, of what these people are doing. Because not only are they not limited in terms of how much money or currency can be created, they're not limited in terms of what they have to show in terms of where it went or what happens if it goes away or what happens if um, anything gets really negative. There's no real auditing going on. There's, there's no real checks and balances to, to any of this. Whereas an outside hard asset could be a check and balance. Currencies that the was the IMF uses. Yes. What does does that have that same kind of effect of sort of stabilizing the volatility? And what effect does that have for China? Like, is it a good thing for them, or is it like problematic if a bunch of their currency gets created to deal with some financial crisis? Right, it's it's a good question. It hasn't had um, yet the kind of effect in terms in terms of the percentage of trade that is done in Chinese currency at this particular moment relative to the, the percentage they have of the basket is still low. So they basically came into this basket between the UK pound, the Japanese yen, and then sort of the euro and the dollar. So they, they kind of came in between third and fourth place. So Japan and China kind of have a, you know, sort of, you know, the, the, the mix and match of what place they're in in terms of third and fourth, but they kind of came in pretty high. Um, but the actual trade that goes on internationally um, in the Chinese rent still remains pretty low, just because it takes time to catch up. So they came in high because of the size of their economy, but in terms of the actual trade that's going on, they're still, um, that number is still small, but going up. And the reason for that is they are very active in creating trade partnerships and currency relationships um, that involve the rent. And in fact, the US banks have opened, just in the last few months, some of the major banks like JP Morgan Chase and stuff have, have opened clearing banks or banks that can actually take um, Chinese currency for the purpose of getting involved in the Chinese market. So I, I think that's going to grow. Um, I don't, the second part of your question again. Uh, I guess I'm confused yeah. about like, what purpose, what purpose right. having their currency in this basket serves. It, it gives them a political seat at the table too. And one of the reasons that they, and, and geopolitical uh, seat at the table, one of the reasons they wanted to match um, their status in the sort of ladder of, of, of the world and, and sort of the entities that run things um, from, a, from a monetary standpoint is because it helps their economic superpower status. It helps their relationships with other countries in their region in, um, throughout the world. Um, and so that's one of the reasons it's beneficial to them. It's sort of like, look, if this is, if this is the basket that's representing the world, and we're actually bigger than several of these economies, then why shouldn't we, we be in it? Because once we are in it, then we can utilize that to, to develop our sort of presence elsewhere. And what they've done with some of the money that they've been fabricating as well um, is they've used it specifically for that purpose of having like better relationships and alliances with countries saying like, you know, you, you give us your workers and we'll build this bridge and we'll finance it. Um, and so a lot of the money that they've created has actually gone outside of China, but for development projects. Um, and, and that's their way. That's their strategy of developing a long-term um, economic presence and a superpower presence by having, you know, like when I, like the beginning video there, I'm in, I'm in Colombo, Sri Lanka um, in, the, in, the, in the first scene of that video. Um, and, and in the middle of Colombo, there's, there's a huge tower and it's, it's reminiscent of the Shanghai Tower, which is like the second tallest uh, building in the world. And, and it looked, it was like a mini version. And you know, when you, when you go around, even when you're studying this, you're not, you're not following every like real estate development in the world. And so I'm in the middle of Colombo, and I'm like, like, oh, that looks, that looks a lot like the Shanghai Tower. That's kind of cool. And of course, it turns out that the Chinese funded it. Um, they had an, their engineers come over and do it. It was a joint effort also with people in Sri Lanka. But the, basically, um, that's how the presence develops. It's, it's like you know, the boots on the ground military. It's like, it's like you know, structures on the ground. So I, I guess I'm still trying to wrap my head around around all this, right? And and still trying to better understand the, the check and balance. So 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 my understanding is when we're looking at this, right? Like the, the, the reason why we haven't seen any crash or fall is because all of the, the players are recognizing each other's currencies, right? Like they're they're recognizing that they're printing, they're playing along. 
and and is is this crash out you know could possibly happen is does that happen when someone says no we don't you know recognize that the money that you've been printing or the money you know that you've been trading back and forth is is not you know admissible anymore we're not going to take it and is that when you know everything crashes because otherwise it, it's just based like on the strength it? of an economy yeah right and what stops it and that, that's kind of the odd thing that's been happening over the last 10 years all of this started out as an emergency policy 10 years ago um, and, and obviously the fact that it still exists is an indication that whatever caused that emergency hasn't really been fixed. And if you pull the plug, yes, it'll be a problem. So whether you pull the plug on, on working with someone else's currency, which these banks can't really do. I mean, they, own each, they trade in each other's currency. They own each other's currency. They, they hold bonds in each other's currency, uh, particularly the holding of the dollar because we have the most amount of debt relative to the rest of, 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 of their, their nations. And, and so the problem is um, if, if, you, if they stop, that, that's one way the system could collapse. If they stop because they don't trust each other, it's because this happens again. It's because you all of a sudden have a bunch of banks going under or, or having a real uh, crisis of some sort that's you know related to a derivative. It's related to uh, derivatives that have, are now partly created from corporate bonds. It used to be mortgage bonds, and those corporate bonds start to default. So those derivatives start to go under, and the whole chain starts to happen again. And they're like, well, wait a minute. We really need to accelerate our sort of move away from these currencies or from each other. That is a, that is how these crises happen. It's not like this definitive statement. Like, Europe can't say we're never going to use the dollar. Like, that just, it's just not going to happen. But what they can do is they can develop sort of relationships outside of the dollar so that if something like this happens again, and the chances are it will start in the United States again, too. Um, because we have lent a lot of money to a lot of countries. We've done all the complex structures. We have sort of more at risk. Um, and we're more codependent in general related, related to the world than other countries are. Um, then, then you could have that, that fall start to happen. So it's not like a decision. Um, we're not going to trust your currency. It's more like we're not going to trust the way you deal with your system. And what, what, what happened in, in, uh, with the developing countries um, in, in the wake of the financial crisis is they, there's, um, and I talk about this in the book, there's a lot more meetings, there's a lot more conferences amongst the, themselves, there's a lot more growth in trade agreements outside of the U.S. and like not necessarily using Japan and then there's ones where Japan's using Europe. There's just a lot of realignments going on and that's a way to say not so much we won't use the dollar, we won't use your currency, but we are cognizant that like this is still on kind of shaky ground. And so the next time there is a financial crisis, Hopefully, we have a little bit more protection, all sort of alternatives, which may or may not happen. It depends what happens. It depends how big that is. I mean, no one really expected the market to be cut by like 45% in 2008 from where it was the year before. I mean, that wasn't an expectation. Um, and even now, when I say this stuff, like the, the market's going to you know, potentially crash, you know, we're up at these like heady heights. Most people um, don't feel the same way. So but it could you know. still happen like a continuation maybe this is like a novice question but then couldn't couldn't everyone just hit the reset button and then build each other back up again well one of the solutions um or the you know, possible paths that i talk about in, in in the last chapter um is this sort of idea of canceling out each other's debt um and doing it in such a way that 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 the countries that are most that would be most burdened by a collapse that were most burdened by a collapse that they did not cause in 2008 um, could be in a more stable situation. What, what's happened with all of this is that the countries that were sort of most at the, at the center of the last financial crisis and have the ability to do more harm financially are the ones that got the most subsidies. And so that just created, you know, sort of more inherent risk. And again, it could go on for, I mean, this could go on for a long time, but it created more inherent risk. So, so that's one of the things that, that, that could also happen. So the word collusion, to me anyway, has kind of a negative connotation. Would you, is it fair to characterize this collusion in your view as something sinister, or do these people responsible for these systems think they're acting sort of in a very uh, honorable way by saving the economy or whatever? Well, it's weird because I mean, I, I think I think most of them believe that that what they're doing is is ultimately going to help the economy, even though. The evidence is that it hasn't. The evidence is that wage growth hasn't really increased. Stock growth has increased, so certain bonuses have increased. But, but the evidence is that the economies that supposedly were fixed are, are really sputtering. Um, and the economies that didn't receive so much quantitative easing are either doing better or they're, they're still sort of caught up in what might be the impact of, 
a, of, of what happens here. So it's, it's, um, it's, it's hard to say. Um, but um, I, I think what, what ultimately will, will happen, though, is, is that at some point these people, they, they shift. Like some of them move out and some you know, new people come in. Um, Mario Draghi at some point has to leave and um, probably or possibly, but probably the um, whoever takes his place will come, say, from Germany or from a country that actually is against this policy and actually would prefer um, that that less artificial money is in the system. Um, and they have political reasons for that. Their economy is doing better than some of the other economies in Europe. So this this goes this has other ramifications. And so a shifting in the actual individuals um, at the top of these institutions could create a shift in the policy. Um, but also, there's a way to unwind this, or at least to start to unwind that actually is using this kind of off the rails solution in, in a good way. Like for example, the Fed could take um, a trillion or two trillion or whatever, their four and a half trillion worth of money they created and assets they received in return for doing that um, and create an infrastructure bank or create a development bank or do something that's actually um, really financing the, the real economy and also sort of moving forward. Um, when I was in China, I took the high speed rail from from Beijing to, to Shanghai, um, and it's it's this. I don't know if anyone has. I mean, it's 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 just a. I mean, when you talk height, it's really fast. Like you cannot see the countryside. Like it is just you. You're, and it's and it's quiet. And it's. I mean, it, it's it's excellent technology. I mean, obviously it costs what it costs. But I mean, that's the kind of development. That's the kind of infrastructure building. Um, you know, developing the technology in conjunction with the sort of real. Um, Real parts of the economy that that real people actually work on that, that's fo that's more forward stabilizing. So you could actually take a lot of the money that's been created, and rather than have it go into debt and have it go into stock, actually have it diverted. Um, nobody's going to be happy about that. It might cause a correction, but ultimately, it's a question of long term versus short term. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, thank you, thank you guys. Thank you.